It's been a while since I have been broadcasting live. This is uh, the Coding Rainbow Show. It's a, uh, at some point, I'll feel comfortable like, saying that that's the title of a thing. Um, I'm here in New York at ITP. My name is Dan. And uh, I, I, I'm probably the least prepared <laughs> for today's session than I've ever been for any session. In fact, I, uh, only in the last two minutes did I think of something that I wanted to demonstrate. Um, so I will be looking at the chat. Uh, to see if people have questions. I think that I'm broadcasting live. I'm going to just take a peek here at the chat to even see. Um, okay, uh, good. So I can see myself over there on this screen. I can see myself on the screen. I can see a camera here. I see audio bars moving up and down. So please, let me know in the chat if you can hear me, if you can see me, if everything looks good in terms of the quality. Uh, if it doesn't look good, let me know so I can do some triage. Um, I also will be using this whiteboard over here. Hello, there's another camera. I'm a little out of practice. <laughs> and I'm going to write something here. Hello. How does the focus seem on that? I'm going to walk over here to look. Ah, it looks pretty good, actually. OK, so um, I'm going to check the chat. Voice not good. OK, I, one person has said the voice is not good. Can anyone here uh, else confirm that the audio is not good? I'm going to sort of hold for a second because I don't want to go too far if the audio is not good. All right, let me see if I can check some things. <laughs> if you're watching this in the archive, just skip ahead 30 seconds. Yes, the voice is crackling. Okay, let me see what I can do about that. Uh, why would it be doing that? Test, test. Is that better? Mm. Test, test. Is this any better now? Sorry for this technical problem. Mm, this is very unfortunate. Test, test, test. Unfortunately, I can't hear. I guess I could put on headphones. Oh, I don't have, I do have headphones. Let me find my headphones. My mic is kaput, okay. Right. I'm gonna have to get a different microphone. Trying to determine where the problem is. Mm. Camera is stuck. Okay. I'm going to use, I know you guys can't really hear me. I was trying to untangle these headphones so I can listen. I, I guess I could just turn off the screen and come back when I have it fixed, but there's a few things I need to test. Oh, these headphones are no good. Let's see if it'll work anyway. Oh my god, this is... I'm sure this is riveting for you guys to watch. going to try to listen here. 
Oh yeah, I can hear, okay, I can definitely hear the static. Okay, I think I might have an idea. Test, 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 test. Is this any better? It's okay now. Is it okay now? Ah, great. Okay. Okay, give me a second, everybody. Okay, good. I'm glad I fixed it. Bad cable somewhere. Uh, if it's too, it might be too loud because I was turning things up and down. Okay, let me just get myself resituated. Confirm that everything is good. Okay, oh wait, I have to click one thing here. Okay, is it okay now? Is the audio okay? <laughs> I'm gonna listen with my headphones just to be sure. Oh, great, okay, great, okay. So we are back. I am back. <laughs> I am 10 minutes into this thing. Oh, okay. So the first 10 minutes of this is hogwash. If that's a word that makes any sense to use in this context, I don't know. Welcome. <laughs> Let me start over again. That's, I'm gonna, uh, my name is Dan. 
I'm just moving some things around here. I'm here live at ITP. I actually have not recorded a video or been live since I'm tying my shoe right now. Just got since 2015 in December was the last time that I recorded anything. Um, uh, I've been away and a bunch of things have been going on. I am hoping to, um, starting in March, my plan is to actually do this twice per week at a regular time where I will do a bunch of different things, just random topics, answer questions, as well as perhaps follow some specific curriculum. So there might be like a continuing, <laughs> it's kind of like sh things that you can watch just as a one-off or things that you can watch over time or a place where you can ask questions. I haven't really figured it all yet out yet, but I'm hoping to focus on this, make more videos, that sort of thing. So be in touch on Twitter and the YouTube comments, that sort of thing. So um, today I'm really, I'm the least prepared for this that I've ever been in the sense that I just happen to be here at ITP. So I thought, oh, I would turn the setup on and try to make some videos. Um, something that I thought about, I think that a topic that I'll start with, and you guys can think about if you have, um, if you have other questions, is something that comes up all the time in my courses, is how to make an object, like a thing that moves around the screen, that stores a history of its path as it's moving around the screen and essentially draws a trail for itself. And you can do this by just not erasing the background so you see the trail, but what if you want to erase the background and what if you want to have its path also move and do respond to physics and that sort of thing. So this I think is going to be a useful demonstration. Uh, and then I'll take, a, I'll, so I'm going to do that. It's probably going to be 10 or 15 minutes. And then I'm hopefully we'll think of some other things too or look at my list of topics or take questions and that sort of thing. So, um, so that's that. Uh, I think I will do this in P5JS. Uh, I could do it both processing and P5JS. Um, excuse me, what, um, I was like, I feel like I was about to burp, which would be an awkward thing to do in a live stream, but it's certainly, I'm sure it's happened before. Um, what I want to look for is p5js.org, uh, download, and I want to go down to the editor. Yeah, I don't think on this computer, I, uh, there is a slightly newer version of the editor, version uh, 0.5.7. Here it comes. Dun, 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 dun. Delete that and extract this and copy to the desktop, uh, replace. So I think, so um, yes, I want to open it. Um, so what I'm going to do here. is first, I'm sorry, I'm getting my, so I'm going to get ready for this. How am I going to get ready for this? The first thing that I'll do is create an object that moves around the screen according to some set of rules. Uh, maybe we'll do some combination of randomness or some combination of Perl and noise. So, okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make a like 10 minute video lesson that's going to be the core material for this, but, and I'm going to record that separately. I'm going to post that as a separate video, but as a warm up, I'm going to start getting ready for that. So, um, to get ready for that, the first thing I'm going to do is make a, um, uh, another tab here in the P5 editor. I'm just going to call it uh, particle.js, and I'm going to make a particle object. And that particle object is going to have an X. And uh, you'll be able to make the particle object at any given X, at any given Y. So this, this particular tutorial that I'm going to do is sort of assumes all of the foundation stuff with JavaScript programming and P5JS that I've already done in previous videos. Um, you guys, give me an idea if you have an idea for how this thing should move around the screen that's maybe different than randomness, but I'll, I'll make a uh, update function, and I forget that I'm making a constructor function, so this dot update equals function, and this dot uh, render show, I'm going to do show equals function, and we'll make this thing a nice little circle uh, that is perhaps some shade of gray with some alpha, and maybe a black outline. And update 
would be, like just to get this going right now, let's just move it randomly. This is kind of not a very interesting thing to do. So right now I'm making, oh, and I, I'm not, I'm sort of out of practice with this. I have this in the wrong place. Is this font size big enough? Can you, can, is this clear in watching the video? Um, if you're in the chat, wow, 35 people are watching now. That's crazy. Uh, that's a lot more than I usually have in these like live streams. <laughs> I've done this for a while. That's a good sign. Okay, hello, people who are watching. Um, so I'm, I'm getting ready to do something interesting that I think will be useful for some of you who are learning about programming and stuff, but I'm just sort of getting ready to it. The first thing that I've done is just written a constructor function for a very generic particle, a particle that just has an x and y. The x and y change randomly, and it has a function to draw itself as a circle. So if I go now and I'm going to save this uh, just to the desktop here, as a uh, history, um, let, me, let me say make a folder with today's date, which is February 9th. Um, and I'm going to save this as uh, particle history one. Um, so now when I go to the main sketch, I want to make a variable called p, maybe I'll call it particle, and say particle e equals new particle, 100, 100, and I should create a canvas. That is, I don't know, 400 by 300. And I should draw a background, which will be slightly gray. And I will say particle.update, particle.show. So I just wanted to get something very basic going here in preparation. OK, particle is not defined. Aha! Oh, this really should be a feature of this nice editor. So I need to go to the sidebar under index, and I need to add a reference to the particle.js file. I'm going to hide the side. I'm doing all this stuff quickly because this is just the preparatory stuff. I'm going to run it. OK, there we go. We got our particle. There it is moving randomly. OK, <laughs> so I'm getting ready. Now, let's think about this. How should we have this particle move in a more interesting way? Could you please lift both your hands and yell, I lost my hands? <laughs> Thank you. I don't know what that means, but I, I don't even oblige a strange request in the chat, which says, ah, I lost my hands. I don't know why. But well, if you just type something in the chat and ask me to do it, I'm not necessarily going to do it, though. <laughs> uh, OK. Um, uh, hello, everyone, live. Uh, great. It's great to see people here in the chat. So I would like this particle to move around in a more interesting way. How about we use uh, Perlin noise to move it? So first of all, it's so tiny. Let's make it a little bit bigger. I'll make it uh, 24. That's good. And let's have it move with some, oh, and the cameras are, are going. Let's have it move with some Perlin noise. Um, that's uh, uh, probably a whole, actually, you know, I don't know if I want to do the Perlin, Perlin noise, because then this video kind of depends on Perlin noise. Um, what if I have it move with, uh, oh, let's just have it be a bouncing ball. That's sort of a, <laughs> yeah, pick your nose. Um, uh, let's have it just be a let's, let's have it be a bouncing ball. So I'm going to do um, a y, I'm going to add a y speed um, and have it change by y speed only the y, and I'm going to add a gravity uh, variable, and I'm going to have uh, the this dot y speed. Uh, change by uh, this dot gravity. And honestly, I don't think it makes sense for gravity to be part of the object. Just make that a global variable. This is something interesting to think about a little bit as an aside as I get ready to do this particular lesson that I'm going to launch into in a second, which is that I'm making this thing called a particle, and the particle has properties. It has its position, it has its speed, it might have a size, it might have a color, and I was about to give it the property of gravity. But then I thought to myself, gravity, that's really conceptually part of the world, it's not part of the object, so instead I made it a variable outside of the object. In this case, I don't know if it really matters so much. You know, all this is just sort of made up anyway for the purpose of something that I'm going to show you in a moment. Um, and uh, if we do this now, if we run this, we can see it's falling with gravity. Uh, and probably under update, then I should check if it gets if it goes beyond the screen. Then uh, let's set its white height back onto the screen and reverse its speed into the other direction. So now we have this bouncing object. Okay, so we have this object that bounces. Great, and um, let's have it, its bounce slow down a little bit when it hits the bottom. 
Um, okay, so I think I'm getting ready uh, to do the first recording, which will be uploaded as a separate standalone video. And in this particular video, what I'm going to demonstrate, I'm going to say this again in two seconds, is I'm going to demonstrate how to have this object store its own path without sim with, um, as an array inside of the object itself. Okay, this comes up all the time. I see people trying to do all sorts of things with, with this. Um, and uh, yeah, so this will be useful, hopefully. Okay. Uh, sine wave. Sine wave would have been good too. Um, ah, I think we'll do some, maybe we'll do something about sine, simple harmonic motion and sine waves maybe in another quick video. It's already 11.30 because I lost all that time with the stupid audio. Okay, so let me um, move over here for a second to drink some of this tea. Can you guys read this okay? Lighting in here and everything is fine? Okay. I don't really love the bouncing ball. Something's going on with my hair. <laughs> okay, uh, the ball is going up. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Um, I thought, I think I just didn't run it again. It's a little bit of a rounding issue. Now, now that won't happen now that I, oops, I'm over here. Okay. Um, all right, I'm not definitely out of practice doing these. I have to, it's good if I do them every, I haven't done this in over a month. Definitely need to do these every week. Um, okay, please give it a name. It's uh, the name, oh, you're right, it is still going up. I guess, uh, no, I don't know if it is. I, I guess I'll be a little bit more, I don't know, somebody suggest a name for this um, part. It should be the rainbow, the rain ball, rain, Bow ball, ball bow, it's a particle. I don't like to use the word ball. It's not really a ball. There's a, it's really just a particle as a thing on the screen. But anyway, here we go. I'm gonna get ready. So I have this other system. I gotta make sure this works actually because I had a problem with this the other day. Um, so hold on, I have to test something really quickly. Uh, that's fine. Um, record to disk, uh, ICM 2015, MP4, 16 by nine, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to hit record and I'm going to do test, test, test. This is a test, test, test. I'm testing something to make sure it works. <laughs> okay. And now I'm going to look on the desktop of this computer. You can't see what I'm doing. And I'm going to make sure something recorded. It looks like it recorded. And um, maybe I can, I'm going to turn on the audio for a second. Okay, that worked. Excellent. So my recording thing works. I got to turn the audio back off so I don't get feedback and close this. And it is still going up like crazy. And stop it from doing that. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, here we go. I am ready now. Boy, I'm really out of practice in this. All right, so let's see. I'm now going to start. Hello and welcome. <laughs> I gotta start over. I gotta start over. Okay, I'm gonna close this. I'm gonna I'm gonna close my view of the chat and get going on this. Okay. Hello, welcome. Uh, in this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to take. Let me run this again how to have an object on the screen store a history of its path. Now, this object just happens to be a bouncing ball. It's bouncing up and down, but you could maybe have something move in a spiral pattern or something move along a sine wave or use something called Perlin noise or move randomly, or maybe you've watched some of my other videos where I show how to have things respond to forces. The point is you have something that you've already programmed to move around the screen. What if you want to draw a trail or to have that history of its path uh, for some other purpose. I feel like this comes up a lot. So on the one hand, you might already say, oh, I know how to do this, right? Because in the basics of using an environment like processing or P5.js, there's this background function and the background function erases the background. So if you were to take the background function from draw, which is continuously erasing the background and move it into setup, now we can see this object is drawing a trail and you can barely see it moving anymore which is something that I should have considered probably, but you can see that it's drawing a trail, but it's kind of, 
this is not really a good solution because A, it's just continuously drawing its trail forever. I can't have some things draw one trail, some things not draw a trail, some things draw a long trail, some things draw a short trail. I can't have the things in the trail changing color or moving according to their own set of principles. So in order to do something, anything, any idea that you have that's a bit more sophisticated beyond just see the thing sort of like smearing a trail of its path along the screen, you're gonna need to keep that background in draw and figure out a way for the object itself to store a history of its own path. So let's think about how we might do that. I feel obligated to use the whiteboard for a second, even though I don't know that it's necessary. So let's kind of unpack this a little bit. We have on the screen, we have a circle. Maybe it's moving, maybe it's your program, it's some sort of like ant-like, insect-like creature and it's moving around. And what you want is for it to have almost like um, this like body that it pulls along along its path um, in some type of way. Oh, this would be a good topic for a video looking at uh, inverse kinematics, all that stuff to create like a skeleton. Oh, that's gonna be good. We'll do that in another video. Here we just want the trail. So the object, if we think of this object as called a particle, as a very generic term for a thing moving around the screen, um, this particle has an X, this particle has a Y, and now, what does this particle need? In addition to the X and the Y, it needs to have something that I'll call a history. And that history can be an array. Because what this particle will do is it stores its X, Y as its current location, but another property of it is actually an array where it can keep track of older X and Ys, and older X and Ys, and older X and Ys. So let's look at how that might be done. So if I come back over here to this particular example, you can see the basics of the code, right? There's a particle object, it makes a new particle object in setup, and then that particle object update and show. Where all of the code, where all of the stuff for that particle object is, is over here in this constructor function. And you can see it's just got some basic stuff. It has an X and a Y variable. It has a Y speed variable, because all this thing is doing is moving up and down. Um, it changes Y by Y speed, it changes Y speed by gravity, it checks if it gets to the bottom, and if it gets to the bottom, it reverses its direction, and then it also has a function to display itself. So what I'm suggesting to you here is the first thing that we need to do is add another property to this object. The way that we add a property to this object is by saying this object, this thing, this particle thing that's going to be made through this constructor function, this dot, the name of that property, and I'm gonna call it a history and I'm going to make it an array. So this is a wonderful thing about working in JavaScript. I'm, um, after I do this video, I'll make a version of this code in processing, and I'll upload both examples so you have the P5 and the processing version. But the JavaScript version will be a little bit simpler because an array in JavaScript natively is a thing that you can just start as an empty thing and start filling it with stuff. Whereas in processing in Java, um, I'll have to build the example with something called an array list, and I will link to other videos about how array lists worked at some point there. So, okay, so this is our first start here. We make this history variable. So what do we do with that history variable? Every time the object updates its location, every time it moves, I wanna store where it previously was. How do I do that? So how do I add something to an array? So this is the update function right here. Right? This is where the y, its x and y location might change, it's moving around the screen. So what I want to do is add something here where I say this.history, and I want to somehow, I want to like add something into this history. So the way that you add something to an array in JavaScript, it, a way that one, there's many ways you can do it, but one way you can some, to add something to the end of that array is with a function called push. So if I were to say push.x, what I'm doing is I'm saying take this object's current x location, and by the way, I can't say x. Ah. I have to say what? Uh, JavaScript, this.x. I have to take this object's current x and put it into the array. So if I did this and ran this program, every time it updated, it would say save its x in the array, save its x in the array, and that array would just become full of its x locations. And we could do something amusing. I don't know how amusing this would be. I'm going to say print its history out, and you can see here, right, I'm getting, I'm printing out these arrays, and there's just tons of values of 100, because its x is never changing. So why don't I put its y in there? And you can see, ah, look, the y values are just being stored, the history of its y values are being stored in that array. Oh, well, maybe I should put both the x and the y. 
And you can sort of see now that array has x, y, x, y, x, y, x, y, x, y. So interestingly, the push function, you can just push a bunch of things in the array by separating them. But this is, this, while this is fine, um, it's worth noting that something that's going to make our life much easier uh, to do this particular example is using something called a vector. So let me come back over here for a second and talk briefly about what a vector is if you haven't encountered it before, and I'm probably going to do some other videos that go through this stuff in more detail. But let's say I have an object. Oh, this pen is terrible. Um, let's say I have an object whose location is at an x and a y. I could have separate x and y variables, or I could have a variable that I'll call a vector and what I could do in P5 is I can call a function called create vector and give it two values. Can you see that? You can. I've gone off the, here, look, live fixing, live editing. This is what I do with live editing. I'm just going to move the camera a little bit so you can see that. Um, so instead of having a separate x and y variable, I can have a single variable using the create vector function to put an x and y in. How, why, why does that work? Why is that relevant? Well, a vector is essentially, one way of thinking of a vector is as an arrow or directions for how to get from one place to another. And here, in this case, an object's location is a vector for how to get from the origin to where it's actually being displayed. And the, you can think of this as a triangle with a y component and an x component. So this arrow is a vector. So instead of that big array that I want to fill, Instead of trying to put an x, then a y, then an x, then a y, then an x, then a y, it'll be much simpler if I say, let's put a vector, an x, y, and then put another vector, another x, y. So I can kind of group the history as its position is this x, y, then its position was this x, y. That history is a whole bunch of vectors. So over here now, if I come back to the code, what I want to do is I'm going to say var uh, v, or a v equals create vector this dot x this dot y and I'm now going to push that vector into the array and run this again and so now as this program is running as this is running over and over again this history array is getting like bigger and bigger and bigger let's take a look at that let's let's look in the console at this dot history dot length so you can see as the program is running, I'm just storing over and over again a vector for every single point that this object has ever been. So right, if I wanted to draw a trail of everywhere it's ever been, then I can simply do that <laughs> pretty easily because I have all those points in an array. I feel like I pause to ask questions, but I can't pause because I'm just making this as a video. Um, OK, so we've now we've got the core mechanic here now which is just this, which is just like every time as the object gets updated, take its current location, save a copy of it, store it in the array. So let's do something with that now. Let's in the display function, I could always now say, I could have a loop to go through that entire array and I could draw, uh, and of course I'm forgetting to say this, this, and now this is a little bit what I think might be worth uh, doing here is make a variable called position, which is this dot history uh, index i. So here what I'm doing is, right here, this is an important little thing to look at for a second, is I want, when I'm going to draw this object, in addition to drawing its current x, y, I'm going to go through and loop through the entire history and pull out each and every spot in the history, index 0, index 1, index 2. And those things are vectors. And I'm going to store them in a variable called pause for position. And now, if I want to draw another circle there, I can just say pause.x, pause.y. Uh, and I'll make this a smaller circle. And we can see now, if I run this program, you can see it is drawing a circle at every spot in its history. And now, you know what? I, I had this idea where like, oh, a bouncing ball is going to make sense. And I just, I just don't like it anymore. Um, let's. Um, Let's get rid of this idea of y speed and grab. Let's just be much simpler about this. And uh, let's just chain and let's get rid of this bouncing thing. Let's just do what I originally set out to do, which I think will demonstrate this idea much better. 
uh, which is just to have it move randomly. So I'm just changing this particle to instead of bouncing up and down, to have it move randomly. So you can see now as it's moving randomly, it's leaving a circle everywhere it's ever been in its path. And I, do, I, am, erasing, I am erasing the background each time. So this allows me to do lots of different things. For example, uh, you know, each one of those circles could be drawn randomly. Their, uh, their size could be random. You know, just so you can see here, I don't, I don't know what the value of this is, but you can see that those things can be animated in their own way. I don't particularly like what I've done with randomness, <laughs> but there's a lot of possibilities there. So this is the simple idea, right, that instead of just drawing a circle at its location, also store a, an array, also keep track of an array that stores a copy of its location over time and draw something there. So I want to add a few things to this. Number one is, I think it might make sense to limit that history, right? So one thing we could say is if this.history.length is greater than uh, 25, then this.history.splice, splice is a function that allows you to pull out things from the array. And I, the oldest thing in the array is the first thing, index number zero, and I want to just take one thing out of the array. So the splice function takes two arguments, the index where you want to delete something and how many things you want to delete, which is just one. So now if we run it, you can see, and let's have it move uh, at, a, at larger steps. So you can see here, and goodbye, it left the screen. Those are too large. Um, <laughs> Let me, I came back, that was nice of it. And we could do something like have its size just be i. So you can see that, um, come back. Okay, well let's do something else too. Okay, ha, ah, so here's the amazing thing about doing this. I only have one particle. And this is like, and first I have this like tiny window, so just so we can see more stuff happening. Um, let's put that in the middle. So, uh, whoops, oh, and it's, uh, oh, editor, you should have changed your size you didn't. Um, so you can see that this gives you a lot more potential now in things that you can do in terms of having this thing store its own history. I, I like barely scratched the surface. I have so many better ideas. You probably have good ideas too. But what I at least want to do is expand this now because the point of having done this and encapsulating this entire idea of the history inside of this object, right? The entire, the, capturing the history inside of this object, now what's possible is, let me make this called particles. Let me not have any particles in setup, and let me loop through. I'm going to let me make an array of all the possible particles, and let me say particles index i dot update particles index i dot show. So now what I've done is I've changed the main program from having just this one single particle to starting with an empty array of particles. And any of the particles that are there, they all should update and they all should show. Now, of course, there's none right now. Why? Because we haven't added any. So now what's exciting about this is let's say anytime I click the mouse, let's add, right? Adding something to an array with the push function, new particle, uh, and let's add it where the mouse is. So now if I run this, look at this. I click there, I click there. All of these objects are all storing their own history, and I can just keep making many of them. So this is pretty great <laughs> um, because now, you know, and just to demonstrate that the background is 100% the background is not being erased, I can have something else move. Uh, I'm going to just move frame count modulus width. I don't know if this is going to work. Boy, I'm like, ah, let me not do this. I'm just going to say frame count zero, uh, frame count height. Just to see, like, there's something moving across the screen that is not drawing a trail. So we can have some things draw a trail. We can have a lot of control over that trail, being that what's the size of that trail? Um, do the objects, uh, do they change color? Do they animate? That sort of thing. So let me, uh, I'm like too addicted to this. I'm like at 15 minutes, you can just stop this and do something else. But I want to do a couple more things with this. So you see this basic example. One thing that I think would be useful to demonstrate is to see that a common thing that you'll want to do is actually draw the trail as 
Uh, oh, I'm, I'm over here now. So a common, <laughs> come on button. A common thing that you might want to do is with this object, draw the trail as a continuous set of lines like that. And a way of doing that is with a begin shape and end shape. So I'm going to comment out the ellipse and I can say begin shape at, bef at the beginning of the loop and end shape at the end of the loop and just say vertex pause.x pause.y. So what I'm actually doing here is making a new shape that's going to appear on the screen and all the vertices of that shape are going to be made up of the history of that object. So if I run this and click, you can see that shape. Now, weirdly enough, that shape is closed and it has a fill. So a couple things I want to do is I want to say no fill. The other thing I might want to do is I, I think I want to make this, let this be a lot longer. And let this be 100. And uh, we can run this. And you can see now, you can see that it's drawing this like squiggly line. And again, if you change this to have it move more smoothly or with some other different algorithm, you can imagine how useful this might be. And again, I can have all of them continue to do this. Now, here's the other thing that's amazing about this. Not only do we have this history stored as data, but because we have this history stored as data in an array, those things can change. So there's no reason why I couldn't say while the object is moving in its update function, right? Its update function does what? It changes the x and y location, then it stores a copy of that x and y location in its history. But there's no reason why while it's moving, I couldn't also loop through the entire array and have hist uh, and I, I always forget that this, this I could say this dot history index i dot x move randomly and index i dot y move randomly. So what I've added here is I'm saying, aha, in addition to the object's location moving, its history, those points also move as well. So now if I draw something, you can see that its history is kind of like undulating as it moves as well. All those vertices, vertices have their own kind of motion to them. So again, I don't really like necessarily my own visual result here because the only thing I'm using as the driving force behind the motion is randomness. But you could imagine what sort of possibilities might there be there in terms of a creature design, um, in terms of color, in terms of smooth motion, in terms of oscillating motion. Uh, boy, like having all of those points like sort of oscillating as if it's like a waving fish or something or a waving snake. There's just so many possibilities. So I hope that I'm going to upload this code example, complete this, upload this video, upload the code example, make a P5 version, make a processing version. If you make something built off of this example, please share it with me in the comments. Uh, I don't understand how this video became 20 minutes long, but it did. And I hope that you found it somewhat useful. <laughs> Goodbye and see you in the next video someday. Uh... Okay, I'm coming back to the chat. I hope people aren't screaming at me, saying that it didn't work. Okay, hello everyone. Did you watch that? There's still, I lost a lot of people. Um, okay, there's a lot of questions here. Um, let me see if I can kind of like scroll back. Uh, okay, so I, I, I'm just seeing more of a discussion, but if you have some questions now about what I just showed or anything at all, please ask them in the chat. I'm going to see if I can think of like one other little quick topic to do. I have to go probably in about 10, 15 minutes, but I'm going to see if I can do one other thing. You just have to bear with me for a second as I um, kind of look here. Um, um, okay, I'm looking, I'm going to look at my, where is my, ah, here's my list of ideas. Yes. Connect, I want to do recording movies out of processing. Ah, this is something I'm going to do. This is perfect. Uh, yeah, everyone's always asking me about this, so I'm going to do this. Okay, the next topic, I'm going to go back to the chat and see if you guys have questions. I'm going to do a quick, um, okay, somebody is asking, is it possible to download the code later? Yes, it 100% will be. I'm going to show you right now where, first of all, this, vi this, this will get uploaded as a standalone video to my channel. Um, and uh, then I have a GitHub repository, github.com slash shiftman slash video lesson materials. 
So I'm, you can see where I am right now. I'm going to link to this in the video's description so you don't need to memorize this. But here is where I keep all of the code that goes with these videos. Um, and here it'll probably be under code P5JS. And it will, this video will get a number or something and the code uh, will be mapped to that based on um, this number in the title. So you'll be able to find it here. I will upload it um, after, at, you know, some point later today. Um, is it possible to use P5 in after, oh, autonomous agents? That would be a great topic. It's a little bit too big for right now. Uh, I do have a bunch of videos already about autonomous agents in the processing nature of code uh, playlists. Those of you who are watching live, if I go to uh, slash Schiffman, um, and I scroll down under, uh, under this one, if you go to the nature of code simulating natural systems with processing, there's a whole lot of these more about vectors, and chapter six is all about uh, autonomous agents. So you can take a look at those if you're interested. Uh, is it possible to use P5 in After Effects? Great question. And in fact, it's essentially the next video I want to make, the next quick little lesson I want to do, will answer that question. So um, it's a little bit tricky to use P5 in After Effects because the, the way that I'm thinking about, okay, there's a, okay, there's a bunch of different possibilities here. The stuff that you're programming in P5 or processing is uh, logic and algorithms that generate graphics. So what you need to do is store the graphics you've generated in some fashion to import it into After Effects. Easy way to do that would be to just store every single frame of animation as an image file, and then you have an image sequence, you bring that into After Effects, you do whatever you want with it. So that's what I'm gonna demonstrate how to do in processing in the next video. Um, but you could also think about, well, what are you really doing? You're making information. So you could create everything as you know, data files, a big spreadsheet with the X and Y and size and color of every position of everything you're drawing, and you could somehow import that and render it in a different way, and there are standards for doing that. So for example, 3D, 3D modeling, you have these different kinds of formats, an OBJ file, and you, that's just the data for the geometry. And so for After Effects, I think you could maybe save everything as vector files, SVG files, or even, I don't know if you could import like JSON files somehow in this particular standard format. I don't know After Effects well enough. I'm sure somebody could contribute to this discussion well, but you absolutely can. Um, <laughs> Um, thanks for your comments, uh, Simon. That's great to hear. Wow, you read the whole Nature of Code, code book in five days. That is very exciting to hear. Um, all right, so I'm going to move on to the next topic that I want to do. I'm just checking Twitter, um, and I'm checking my email to see if anybody <laughs> has written anything important, like, please get off the internet. Uh, no. So, okay, so the next thing I want to do, I'm going to close this and quit this. Close this, save this. The cameras are shutting off. I'm going to open up, is this 3.0.1? Let me make sure that is. So the next thing I'm going to do is in processing. Let me okay, so the next topic that I want to demonstrate, which also I get questions for a lot, is how to record a video of something you made in processing, which you could do to import it to After Effects, to incorporate it in another project, or just for documentation purposes, that sort of thing. So let's go, I guess my question is, what should I use as the demonstration for this? Um, I kind of like, let's think of, I could just do the flocking system. Mm, that would be the sort of obvious thing. I'm looking under fractals. Oh, you know what kind of would might be nice? Let's do, I got a good idea. Let me do the game of life. Let's record this into a movie file because I think what would be interesting about doing this is if I make it 1920 by 1080, it runs, it actually runs remarkably fast. <laughs> uh, let me look at the frame rate for that. Uh, No, it's only 12 frames per second. Okay, so that's good. Sorry, I'm, I'm, so I'm gonna do this, but we'll start with uh, 640 by 360. We're gonna record this as a video, render it as a video. I'm gonna take out this frame rate. Okay, and uh, take this out. 
I don't need this either. And I'm going to delete this. I'm going to save this as a game of life, game of life record. And I'll put this on the desktop. Okay. This should be a pretty short video. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do is demonstrate how to record this to a movie file that you could upload to Vimeo or YouTube or bring it into another project. And we'll look at some different ways that you could start and stop recording, um, that type of thing. Okay. Um, and I'm going to... See how this goes. Okay, sorry, I've like lost my train of thought. Oh, look at the little glider going on there. Okay, uh, here we go. Test, test, test. Oh, you know what I'm going to do? <laughs> I'm going to set this running, and so it's running, and then hit record. Hello and welcome. In this video, I'm going to show you how to take a processing sketch and render it to a movie. So this comes up a lot and there's probably a variety of ways that you could do this. So I'm going to show you a particular technique that hopefully will be useful to you. So I, you know, I picked this arbitrarily. It's one of the examples from my Nature of Code materials. Um, it is a, a simulation called the Game of Life, a cellular automata system, automata. Boy, I'm, I'm never going to get that right ever in my life. Um, and it just, it's a, an, a, an arbitrary animation. But anything, anything at all that you draw to the screen in processing, you can render as a video out of processing. Why would you want to do this? Well, there's a variety of reasons. One is uh, you might want to upload something to Vimeo or YouTube or some other um, <laughs> website to host a video. Uh, you might want to bring this into another project. Maybe you're working on an animation in, in something like After Effects and you want to have some elements that you've programmed in there. I can, Think of some, I'll try to include some examples of people who have done this kind of work in the YouTube description below. So you might want to take what you're doing and incorporate it into another project in video form. Another thing might be actually that you just, the thing that you made is beautiful, but it runs incredibly slow. And you want to, you don't need it to run in real time. So you could render it as a video so that it could run at 30 frames per second and play back as, at a, as an installation or whatever it is you might be doing. So let's look at how you might do that. And there's, there's a, there's a bunch of steps to it, um, um, and I'll try to go through them. <laughs> so the first thing that I will show you, oh, and you know what? This font is remarkably small. So let me just show you in Processing 3, I can go to the Preferences. I'm going to change the Editor font to 36, and I think that's going to be a little bit better. Hopefully you can see that. Um, okay, so what's the first thing that I want to do to this? So what I'm going to do is say, so there's, uh, there, there may be some other uh, processing libraries you can get to render directly to a movie file, but what I'm going to show you how to do, instead of rendering directly to a movie file, you can always just save what's on the screen as an image. So for example, if I put save, um, the function save, and I say um, gol.png, right, I'm just going to put that in draw, and I'm going to run it, you can see, first of all, you can know if you can tell if it's running slower or not. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. I'm going to close this, and I'm going to go to that sketch folder, and you can see right there, there now is a file called gol.png, and you can see it's a snapshot of what was on the screen. Now, I was doing that in draw, so it was doing it over and over and over again, and what we're seeing now is just the last frame that it drew. So the save function is a way, and you might put that in mouse press or attach it, you know, you might at some point just want to use save just to save a snapshot of what's on the screen. But if you use the save frame function, what the save frame function allows you to do is include the pound symbol, the hash symbol, and what it will do now is auto number the files. So every time you call save frame, it's going to save gol underscore one, gol underscore two. So this now, if I'm executing this in draw, every time through draw, I'm going to get a new image file. And I'm going to run this. And I'm going to try not to run it for very long. Oops, did I leave it running? Because <laughs> now I'm going to go in and be like, oh my goodness. And you can see there, here it is. I have an image file for every single uh, thing that was saved. 
uh, every single frame. Now, I don't like this. This is kind of a disaster because I have a zillion files and it's polluting my file system here. So I'm going to delete these and I'm going to show you what I think would be more useful to do. I'm going to make just a directory. I'm going to call it output slash gol pound, 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 pound. And I'm going to run this and I'm going to let it run. Okay, that was enough time. And uh, now you can see I have this all here and I can just cycle through it and you can see there it is, every single frame. And by the way, I'm using the PNG file format which will save uncompressed. So this way the full quality is there in each and every frame. This way later on you could choose to compress it or different codec, whatever you want to do with your video that's a bit outside the scope. So now the question is what do you do with these files? <laughs> so you could bring them into Final Cut Pro or iMovie or MPEG Studio 159ZY Pluto Magic thing, Rainbow, I don't know, is there a rainbow in there? Whatever it is, you can find your own software. Lots of software can take an image sequence, After Effects will do this for you, and render it to a movie. It so happens that if you want the sort of quick way of doing it, processing up here under the Tools menu, under Tools, there is a Movie Maker tool. So if I go to click here Movie Maker and select it, it opens up an interface that says, this tool, and you, I don't know if you can read that, this tool creates a QuickTime movie from a sequence of images. Blah, 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 gives you a bunch of information, all sorts of things you can do. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to the finder, I'm going to find this output folder, and I'm going to drag this output folder right here. And then I'm going to look here and say like, okay, um, my, uh, it's, it's, it's giving me a default height of 640 by 480, but I want to change that because my processing window itself was 640 by 360. What's the frame rate that I want? Oh, and I guess I could have clicked same size as originals, in which case it would just use the size of the, the file. Um, and then I can pick whether I want to have some sort of compression. I'm going to pick animation, which basically means no compression. So I'm going to get a very big file, but I'll be able to bring it into some other software. Again, if I'm using this in After Effects, it's going to need to be recompressed later, so I don't want to compress multiple times. So I could also bring in a sound file if I wanted to include some sound with it. I'm not going to worry about that. And I'm going to hit uh, Create Movie, and it wants me to save it somewhere. I'm going to uh, put it on the desktop as testmovie.move and hit Save. And <laughs> did that already happen? Did it just like do it so fast? Normally it shows a little progress window, but maybe I just had so little. Uh, Testmovie.move. I'm going to open this up. Uh, come on, QuickTime. And yep. Oh, so it just happened so fast. You can see it. There it is. So now I have a movie file that I can save. Uh, wow, amazingly, if it was longer, you would have probably seen a little progress bar for it rendering it. And you can see this is just a uh, QuickTime movie that I'm playing. Fantastic. So that's the basic gist of it. Uh, in six minutes, I kind of showed you the main piece. But I think we could do a little bit more here because you might be in a situation where you want to start and stop the rendering to a file. Um, you might want to uh, be able to see some information on the screen, whether it's rendering or not. So I'm just going to add a couple more um, pieces to this program just to make it a little bit more sophisticated. Okay, so, so one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a Boolean variable called recording. And I'm going to assume that we're not recording when the program first starts. So Boolean recording equals false. So, and then I'm going to say if recording, this is where I should save those frames. So the other thing I want to do, by the way, now that I finished and made that movie, maybe you need backups and stuff, but I'm just going to go and delete that folder because I don't want to save the previous, uh, I don't need to save those previous raw files. I have everything that I need right here in QuickTime now. And I will just save that. Um, the, the, the movie file again. Um, so now only if, only if the Boolean variable recording is set to true will it actually save those frames. That's a useful thing. Now what I'm going to do is say, let's say what I want to do is uh, have a way, okay, so if I say, you know, this isn't that interesting, but let's use key pressed. So uh, if I could say if key equals R or key equals capital R, recording equals not recording. 
So what this is going to do is when, oh, I run, I'm in JavaScript land, I wrote function, void. Um, what this is going to do is it's going to say anytime I press R on the keyboard, it will start recording or stop recording. It's going to toggle the Boolean state of recording. If rec not true is false, not false is true. So recording equals not itself. If it's false, become true. If it's true, become false. So that's going to happen there anytime I toggle it. And you can see, like, if I run this program, and I go to the files, we can see that it's not recording. If I hit, if I click in here and I hit R, you can see suddenly new files are appearing. If I hit R again, those new files will have stopped. So simply by adding a quick little something to the program, I can kind of turn on and off the recording. Now also what would be nice here is for me to be able to see some visual indication on the screen as to whether it's recording or not. So what if, I just right here, I say, okay, um, fill uh, red, otherwise fill green, and draw a circle, I don't know, at the middle of the screen, towards the bottom, that's like a circle. So if we run this, you can see there's a little green, this is like terrible visual design, but there's a little green circle there when it's not recording, and when I hit record, that circle turns red. When I hit record again, that circle turns green. I don't know if those are the right colors, the right visual indicators you want, but you get the idea. I can toggle the color of that circle and know whether I'm recording or not. Very useful. But, but are you thinking in your mind, oh no, there's a big problem. I don't want a big, ugly, green or red circle in my video. But one thing that's wonderful about the save frame function is it's going to save the current view of the processing window. And guess what? The circle is drawn after I call save frame. So save frame is going to save what's in the window and then draw the circle on top of that. That circle won't get saved to the file. So we should be able to see if I go back to um, here and delete that. I'm going to run this and I want to start recording for a little bit. It's recording, it's recording, it's recording, recording. I want to stop recording. And then I'm going to close here. I'm going to go and look. Let's just look at these files. No green or red circle. So we've done it. We're, we're able to add a little visual indicator into our window as to whether it's recording or not. Um, I think that's the gist of it. I've tried, ah, so let's just like show something sort of nice that we can do here, which is that if I were to run this at 1920 by 1080, like super high resolution, um, and I'm, gonna, uh, I'm just going to put print line uh, frame rate in here. So I'm going to run this. You can see that processing is not able to render the game of life. It might be hard for you to see this in this sort of like captured video tutorial, but it's not able to run this super fast at such high resolution. And um, it's actually quite fast. You can see the frame rate is about 14 frames per second, but I want to make this glorious game of life simulation that runs at 30 frames per second. So now if I do this, and I hit record. You can see, by the way, it's slowing down also while recording because there is, if there's some energy and computation and time that it takes to render these to a file. If I run this now, run this to, uh, render this to a file, and I stop recording, and I skip out of the program, and I go back to Tools, Movie Maker, and I, uh, uh, whoops, go up here, and I get this output folder and I drag it into here, it's the same folder. Uh, now this needs to be 1920 by 1080. And of course, I could just select the same size as original frame rate, create movie, and I want to do test movie 1080, and hit save. And you can see now you're seeing the little progress window, it's just not doing it as fast this time. It's creating the movie. And then uh, it's finished, and I'm going to go to the desktop, uh, to look at what I've rendered and test movie 1080. I'm going to open this up, <sighs> converting um, so that QuickTime can render it. Come on, QuickTime. <laughs> okay, there we go. I'm going to make this full screen. I'm going to play it. You can see I've got my 30 frames per second game of life simulation all programmed in processing. So, oh, I don't know what just happened. Oh, it's, you know what? I left some old files in there. So it like, rendered at the end, that's so it's stitched two together. 
it stitched like the high resolution one with the low resolution one together. That's kind of interesting. So anyway, you can see um, all sorts of possibilities. I hope that this helps you um, with things that you might be making in processing. You can do this with 3D. Uh, you can do this with just about anything. Um, and let me know how it goes for you. Um, so thanks for watching this video and I will be back soon with more videos. And okay, chat. Okay, boy, there's a lot of discussion in the chat. Um, oh, Java, oh yeah, P5JS and JavaScript, yeah. And people are answering the questions. Okay, so um, I don't know if anyone's still here. Uh, live dashboard I can usually see. Oh wow, there's quite a few people still here. Um, so I think this ends my time for today. I did two quick video lessons about two random topics. Um, I don't know how far into the universe whatever I say now will make it, but I'm probably not going to be making too many more videos until March, unfortunately. I might do a couple the last week of February, but starting in March, the week of March 7th or 4th, something like the second week of March, I will be doing hopefully video lessons, twi live streams twice a week, two to three hours each time with lots more content. Um, so stay tuned. I'm going to do that in March and in April and in May and in June. Um, I only have, I don't have very little travel then. I'm going to be doing it um, a lot. <laughs> so hoping to expand the audience and make more stuff. And I'm always looking for suggestions and ideas and comments and feedback. So let me know. I, you have uh, one or two minutes to ask a question in the chat before I turn this thing off. I will look here, just check a couple things. Um, I don't see anything super uh, crazy. Um, check if the chat is going. Uh, more comments below. You're welcome, everybody. Okay, so I don't see any questions in the chat, so I'm going to assume this is good for today. I have been doing this for oh, only an hour and six minutes somehow. I don't know. I thought it was much longer. Um, maybe I should do one more topic. <laughs> Let me look at my list. I thought I was already doing this for two hours. Uh, processing an eclipse. Oh, yeah. Oh, instance mode in P5.js. People have been asking me about that. I'm a little afraid to do that. Uh, oh, App Stream, yeah. That's something I want to do. Uh, well, I think I probably actually am going to move on today. <laughs> it's very tempting, but because I don't have that much time anyway. Um, so, okay, so thanks everybody. I'm going to turn this off in a second. This whole thing will get archived. It has about a half an hour of fail at the beginning where I was trying to fix the audio. And um, then um, that's, that's that. Uh, that's that. So um, yeah, okay, so I'm going to turn this off. I will be back soon, um, sometime very soon I hope, and thanks for listening. <laughs> I have had trouble. Uh, somebody wants to know how to work with the database. These are all good questions. Um, um, yeah, you know, I used to, I was about to make all these videos about parse.com, and parse.com decided to close its doors. I think it was bought by somebody like Facebook or something like that. But I was thinking of you doing MongoDB Labs, uh, database as service. So this is something I'm going to look into and do some videos about in the future. Um, okay, thanks everybody, and I'm going to sign off. And I will see you at the next live stream. Lots more are coming soon, but the month of February is a bit tricky for me. But I, I hope to do more, and please be in touch. Okay, goodbye, everyone. I'll still look at the chat. <laughs> Even after I, I have some trouble pressing this button to say goodbye. Uh, okay, here I'm going to do it.